Okay, everybody. Hi, everyone, and thank you for spending time with me today, and welcome to my e-commerce and alternative selling methods webinar. My name is Christopher Garcia, and I'm the business development specialist of the SBDC at UNM Valencia campus. I created this webinar based on a great article called Selling Without a Score by Tamara E. Holmes, and you'll receive a copy of that article. My contact information is on the next slide, so let me go to my next slide. And I'll also send you a PDF of the sl these slides in the follow-up email. And uh, let me show you that follow-up email if I'm able. I'm going to stop share one second. Okay, let me bring back my share. We use a, a program called Constant Contact to send out our follow-up emails. Your, the email may end up in your junk or your spam box, so please make sure to check those. And you should expect it in one or two days. So this is what the follow-up email looks like. If there's one thing you get from today's presentation, it's to register for your Google My Business profile. And I put that in the, in the language there. Here um, are all the documents and links to websites that I'm going to talk about today. There's Tamara E. Holmes is selling without a store, so on and so forth. So let me go back to my slideshow and we can get into the good stuff. Before we begin, let's go over some webinar ground rules. Everyone on the call right now is muted, so don't worry about background noise. And there's a feature to raise your hand, and I'll use it to make sure the webinar is flowing and to ask you questions throughout the presentation. In fact, I wanna see if all everybody, I wanna make sure everybody knows how to raise their hand. I'm gonna raise mine, so if you all raise your hand for me. It's in that black ribbon. Oh, I, I don't even have to tell you, you guys are doing good. Perfect. Okay, I'm gonna lower everybody's hands. If you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A and the Q&A uh, options at the bottom of your screen in the black ribbon. And then I'll answer those questions at the end of the presentation. Each slide is numbered, so if you, um, have a question about a particular slide or want to revisit that slide, please include the page number in your questions. And I want to test the Q&A just to make sure everybody knows how to use it. So if you all send me a hi, hello, how are you in the Q&A, I will reply back to you. Hello, Nicole. Good morning, Martha. Good morning, Candice. Good morning, Giselle. You're already uh, hot with your question, and the answer to that's yes. And if you have want to follow up more about that, I could I could uh, elaborate more on that question. Hi, Diane. Hello, Michelle, and hello, Don. So welcome, and thanks for joining me again. Let me get rid of your hello, so I have room for all the Q and A. OK, 
Okay, this slide has some beta training offerings, but I always like to turn this over to our webinar host today. Her name's Leslie Everstead, and she's invaluable to the operation of these webinars. Hi, Leslie. Hi, I'm just here in the background listening to you, Chris, because you give us such great information, but uh, <laughs> you do. I am, and I'm glad to see everyone got on today. Um, I want to update everyone on what we have coming up uh, this week. Just This is just coming up in the next couple of days and then through next week, but we have cash is king, cash management for your small business. We have a bilingual session on accessing uh, financial resources. We have a great uh, presenter that's going to be talking about implementing your business plan. He's got a two-part series, so you can go to either session or both of them. But this part's going to be about access, uh, implementing the plan. Then we have Eric Spellman. He is a great pre presenter on um, all kinds of marketing and YouTube and all kinds of those uh, uh, things that you're wondering about. He's going to be here on Be the Star. Uh, look for that. And then finishing up the week, we have Peggy McDonough, and she's going to be talking about Are You Tax Ready? PPP, idle, and employee retention tax credits. And she always keeps up with the latest information. So look for those and let me know if anyone has uh, needs help getting into the webinars. So turn it back over to Chris. Thank you, Liz. And again, the website uh, is at the bottom of the screen and that's where you register for upcoming webinars. Let's go to our next slide. Okay, here are our objectives or the agenda for this webinar. I'll explain how the SBDC can assist you, introduce you to a marketing plan, introduce methods for taking your business online or selling in another way, and provide practical resources to assist your business with an online presence. It's a lot to cover in one session, but I think everybody on the call today is up to for the challenge. So let's begin. Here is a graphic of the center locations, our center locations throughout New Mexico, and the mission of the SBDC is to build skilled entrepreneurs and strong businesses by offering no cost confidential business consulting and lower no cost training events like this one. You'll notice a blurb on the bottom of the slide. This is a disclaimer from our stakeholder, the Small Business Administration. Uh, we are funded by the state of New Mexico and, the small, and in part by the Small Business Administration. And now I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about the SBDC in the next few slides. We offer two major services, again, confidential business consulting and lower no cost business trainings. And there are no limits to how much no cost counseling or trainings you can receive. We have centers throughout New Mexico, so there's uh, bound to be one close to you. And if you look at the graphic in the upper right hand corner, it shows what we do, renew, grow, launch and start up small businesses. We welcome you to our statewide trainings like this one and to participate in your centers, webinars and workshops. So your local center may have their own uh, webinars or in-person workshops um, and we welcome you to those. This slide shows what we expect from our clients. My fellow business advisors and center directors want you to succeed. So you'll be assigned homework or further research so please do the work necessary to succeed. We can't make decisions for you or offer tax or legal advice. We can only connect you to the information you need to make an educated decision. And part of making an educated decision is working with uh, licensed professionals like attorneys or certified public accountants. And I'll show you a resource later on how to seek out an attorney. Finally, I want to remind you about important surveys we send out as part of attending these trainings. Everyone who registered for this webinar received an email from Leslie Everson saying, in anticipation of the upcoming e-commerce and alternative selling methods webinar event you have registered for, we'd like to collect some preliminary information from you. With this information in hand, we can tailor the course material to better fit your needs. That's an exact quote, believe it or not. So let's do a poll. I just want to see by a show of, show of hands, how many of you received the pre, um, let me see what it's called, the pre workshop e uh, evaluation? 
Oh, good. I see a lot of you did. I hope you uh, did that evaluation for us. It's part of our SBD, SBA guidelines. And I see the majority of everybody on the call did, so I appreciate that. You'll also receive a post survey for this webinar. And um, it's pretty quick and easy, so please do both. And if you, for whatever reason, didn't receive this, uh, the review, the pre or post survey, please contact Leslie Everson, or you could contact me. Okay, now let's jump into the marketing plan. So why is a marketing plan important when changing or adding selling methods? It's because online sales is all about identifying your target market or markets, analyzing your product or service offerings, creating a profitable pricing strategy, and successfully distributing your products and services, and effectively promoting your products and services. So what I went over with you are the four P's of marketing, product, price, price, and promotion. So step one, identify your target market or markets, and then evaluate the four P's. Then create benchmarks, to track results, and analyze your outcomes. And then I have a great uh, learning resource for you from our partners at the SBA. Every activity you do in business should align with your target market or markets, because these are the customers most likely to purchase your product aka those customers you don't mind spending money on. If you think everybody in the United States or New Mexico is your target market, think again. You'll most likely go broke promoting your product to everybody in the United States. So create a perfect customer in your mind, then describe him, her, or it. I'll uh, show you a great research tool offered to you at no cost by the SBDC uh, that helps you figure out what your markets are in your industry if you don't already know. And I want to give you an example. So the example I want to use is a women's uh, Western wear store. So there's a, a women, there was a women's Western wear store in Belen, New Mexico. And because of COVID-19, uh, they may have to take their business online because sales may be down. So the ideal customer is a woman with a household income of 100,000 or more who purchases high-end clothing and shops online. If the clothing that was sold was Western, oh, okay, it's Western. You might look for women with interest in bull riding, farming, and country music. If my products are modeled after fa a famous country music singer, um, you might want to target those who listen to, say, the music of Taylor Swift. Now that we've identified our ideal customer, we can tailor the products or services to their needs and wants. The research tool I'll talk about later suggests the most popular products in women's clothing are accessories, tops, bottoms, dresses, and outerwear. And at the store, they've been selling products so they know what products are hot sellers, high profit items, and unique to their store only. And it's important to keep, in, keep your online inventory lean because you're charged per posting, per photograph, or per sale. It's also very time consuming to photograph these items, write uh, descriptions, post them online, accept orders, ship, and handle returns and exchanges. So choose your uh, product line wisely and profitably. Price is also very, a very important factor in online sales. You may have lower overhead when selling online, but you have other costs to think about like posting fees, payment fees, monthly subscription fees, yearly website fees, website or online store maintenance, and time for fulfilling orders, uh, answering customer questions, and time for returns and exchanges. It also entails navigating through websites, online marketplaces, and online payment processors. Do you have the skills to do this or do you need to hire somebody? Uh, there may be other online sellers selling the same product as you for more or less, so research the selling price online. There are two common methods for setting a price, cost plus and market pricing. If you have a unique product, you can set a price by figuring the cost and adding a markup. If you sell a common product, you can research the selling price on online marketplaces by visiting store websites and doing Google research. The things, uh, the thing that's great about the big online marketplaces like Amazon, eBay, Etsy, is they have a lot of data. They could, they have a lot of data, so they could compare what your cost, what your price is compared to other people selling online, and they often recommend a price range for you, or tell you if you're uh, number one or you're the price leader. In this example, we're selling online, so why is the place or distribution 
so important? It's because we have more choices than ever for selling products online and fulfilling orders. You can choose to sell your products from your website. You can use an online marketplace. You can offer pickup and delivery at your storefront, or you could use a third party app for pickup like Amazon Hub. And I thought it was pretty cool. We have an Amazon Hub at the all subs in most of this. So after figuring out our product price and place, you can think about promotion. There are more ways to promote your business than ever before. And some common methods are blogging, creating a website, personal selling, social media marketing, word of mouth or reviews, and other media. When picking a promotion method, keep your target market and budget in mind. Some interesting ways to promote your product online include paying or giving free merchandise to bloggers and vloggers to promote your product in their article or video. And I like to give the example of unboxing videos. I like to watch those unboxing videos when somebody orders a mystery package online. And uh, you could seek out a lifestyle expert. Say you sold uh, baby clothes. You could uh, seek out somebody who blogs about um, raising children or, or uh, like new mothers. You could use social me media and pay for ads or do or, um, organic posts. And most, and most importantly, you could claim your, Google, your presence on Google My Business and other search engines. Bing offers um, a way to claim your profile there and so does Yahoo. And the, for the example of a women's Western store, you might consider sending a YouTube lifestyle expert um, some of your products so they can wear them on their uh, videos. You could use Facebook ads to target women with our selected interest in places where Western wear is popular. Or you could send a postcard to your repeat clients, say you had a storefront, letting them know you have an online store. After making those decisions, think of promotional goals like reaching 100,000 viewers on, face, on your Facebook ad, track the results and calculate your return on investment. So say you spend $100 on a Facebook campaign and you reach 75,000 viewers, the cost per viewer is less than a penny. So I think that's a pretty good campaign. And to learn more about marketing, everything I gave, the rundown that I gave you about the marketing plan, it's available from our partners at the SBA. Here's sba.gov. And remember, I have those links for you in the follow-up email. So let's go to the follow-up email and see if that works a little bit better than my slideshow has been. SBA's lesson, SBA's Marketing 101. So here's the SBA's Marketing 101 online lesson. You could go into the video modules. It should take you too very long. It usually tells you how long it's going to take. I think when I took this, it took me about an hour, hour and a half. And then what I like best are these Marketing 101 worksheets. So if you look at these worksheets, the two I suggest you use if you want to do anything with marketing or make uh, very informed decisions about your promotional methods are to go to the Marketing 101 checklist and just do the checklist for your uh, each product or service or for your segments that you offer. And it takes you to about everything you need to know. But when you're doing this, you always have to keep your target market in mind. So say I was selling churros at local festivals, I probably don't need an online store for that. I may, maybe I need a web presence, but I probably don't need an online store. Okay, there's that worksheet. And then my favorite one is Marketing 101, a guide to winning customers. And that this takes you through everything I just talked about step-by-step, step. Uh, identifying your target market or markets, the four Ps of marketing. And then at the bottom, it gives you the common, uh, um, tracking ratios you might want to use, like customer lifetime value, return on investment, cost, uh, cost per customer acquisition. And return on investment, I think, is the, most, the simplest and, and most uh, effective way to get your point across when you're trying to talk about promotional methods. So now that we talked about marketing, let's get into the the brunt of selling without a store. That's the article that Tamara E. Holmes 
row. Okay, we're gonna talk about selling online first. Many people think it's less expensive and easy to sell online, but that isn't always the case. You must research your options, fees, and staffing to make sure you have the time and manpower to successfully sell online. There are two major options for selling online, selling directly from your website or using a third-party site like Shopify or using an online marketplace like Amazon, Etsy, or eBay. The pro of selling from your website is you save on marketplace fees. The con is you're doing all of your own marketing, search engine optimization, web maintenance, you're tracking orders on your own, and you're taking on the liability of processing and storing sensitive data. Using an online marketplace is a bit easier because they process the payments for you, track orders, create policies, and market your products across the web and to their existing customers. And they have an established clientele, which is great. If you don't have a website already, you have to create one, whether you use a web designer or an online website builder. There are three components to every website, the domain or web address, the code or what you see, and the host for putting the website online. And they all have costs associated with them, requiring monthly or annual payment. And you also have to maintain your account. So choose your provider wisely, whatever's easiest for you to use. You could also purchase your um, domain, your hosting, and your design all separately. When opting to sell online, ask yourself if you have the processes and staff to successfully sell online. There must be someone to list items, change prices, photograph your items, write product descriptions, maintain a website or an e-commerce profile, return customer emails, fulfill orders, ship orders, and handle returns and exchanges. And each marketplace is different, and you could use one or many, but they all require time. And like one of my favorite bands says, your garden will never grow unless you bless it with your time. Fees run about 10% for product listings and payment processing. Some marketplaces have monthly fees when using a business account. Uh, they might charge extra for adding videos, extra photos, and you could pay for what they call SEO or keywords. Uh, when you're thinking about an online marketplace, it's a big database of uh, products for sale. And the way they, they um, tag those products in the database are with keywords. So if somebody's searching for scissors, uh, they may search for uh, cutting tools, other things, key keywords that could lead you to the products you need. And they have, you could purchase them and they have fees associated with them. So make sure you're only what, doing what you're able to handle and afford. And don't waste money posting items across all e-commerce sites using an e-commerce uh, management software if you're only selling, say, 10 tops per month. Keep the interest of your target market in mind and use those distribution channels that appeal most to them. Perfect. Let's move on. Here are some popular e-commerce sites that all of, and all of us may know about the first three, Amazon, eBay, and Etsy. There are many options vying for your money, so choose your marketplace or marketplaces very carefully and always keep the interests of your target market in mind. Since online marketplaces make more money as you sell more products, the bigger ones have great learning resources and customer service, so keep that in mind. In the follow-up email, I included links for Amazon Sellers Academy, eBay Sellers Guide, and Etsy Sell Sellers Education Portal, and Shopify Sellers Academy. They also have great blogs and salary events. So, and um, let me give you some examples of what each are good for. So say you sold mass produced women's handbags, Amazon might be a good option for you. If you sold vintage women's dresses, eBay might be uh, your main portal of distribution. And if you sold hand knit women's cardigans, Etsy would probably be your best bet. And sites like Shopify are e-commerce marketplaces that offer web design services or connect easily to your existing website. Large and what they call them are this WYSIWYG, which stands for what you see is what you get. Website builders offer e-commerce apps like Wix, WordPress, and Weebly. And remember, you can always consult with an advisor if you wanna dive into any of these topics a little further. 
when selling online, product photography is vital to your success. As you can see from the image on the left, it has bad lighting and isn't very attractive versus a picture on the right that has good lighting and fo uh, photo effects at it. It kind of, that model of Clamato almost looks angelic. The difference speaks for itself. And if you don't have experience with product photography, take a look at Shopify's article and do it yourself. You could hire a local photographer and they're probably hurting because of the COVID restrictions. Or you could use a stock image website. Or if you sell a common product, you could ask a wholesaler if they have product images you could use. Be careful when using photos found online because they may be copywritten. So in the follow-up email and on the slides, I included a link to the definitive DIY guide to beautiful product photography and the beginner's guide to product photography. When I was selling online, if I had read these before I started uh, photographing my items, I, I think I would have had much more success and I could have done it much uh, um, in more inexpensively. You could hire somebody and I use the example of Fiverr. There's other, uh, the, what, what Fiverr is, is it's a, um, a website where freelancers post um, ads for their work. So this happens to be uh, product photography on Fiverr. There's other ones like Upwork, TaskRabbit, but uh, Fiverr's the, the example I like to use in this uh, series because they had a particular option for product photography. So here are the people buying for, to photograph your products for a fee. Let's go back to our presentation. And then let me show you a stock image website. So there's Pixabay, uh, iStock. This one happens to be Adobe Stock. Um, Leslie Everson actually showed me this one. And these um, stock image websites just have a bunch of different pictures you could use. And you could use these photographs if you purchase them on your website or on different marketing materials. And they have different licenses um, that they offer. WYSIWYG website builders like Weebly and Wix, they are also have some stock images that you, and GoDaddy that you could use. So let me see. I like to, I, as you see, I use the example of a can opener. So say you needed an image of a can opener to use in your marketing material. You could take it yourself, or if you needed one in a pinch, you could always use a stock image available to you as long as you purchase the license. I wanted to show you an example on Google Sometimes we type in uh, we do image searches on Google and we think we could just use whatever images pop up, but that's not always the case. So see, we have a ton of images of can openers, but if you wanna see the ones you could legally, you may be able to legally use in your marketing materials, go to tools and you go to usage rights and you go to Creative Commons licenses. And these are the images that uh, are available for you to use. So be careful when you're selecting images and make sure not to step on anybody's copyrights. The next, this so product photography, I would say is probably the most important thing when selling online. The second most important is writing a compelling product description. So on the screen, there's an example of a good and a bad product description. The one on the top is from a private seller on eBay. And the one on the bottom is from the manufacturer of the, the item being sold, which is shopchuka.com. The bottom description is appealing to the target market's needs and wants and is very descriptive and uses key words that increase search engine optimization. Keep those things in mind when creating a product description. And I included a link for an article to how to write a co compelling product description in the follow-up email. I also included a link to nine ways to write product descriptions and inform and persuade your customers. And that's included in the follow-up email. There are lots of opportunities to better sell products with great descriptions on sites like Amazon, eBay, or Etsy. And I've noticed that many sellers on Amazon may not speak English as their primary language, so things get lost in translation. They also don't provide the buyer with the information they need or want. 
So I was looking for a heat proof uh, pitcher so I could make iced tea. I wanted one that was large enough. I, I drink at least, uh, you know, four, maybe four quarts of iced tea. Uh, and all the measurements for these iced tea containers were in milliliters. Here in the United States, we think in, in a, a different way. So if, if I was selling a product like that, you could, you could see there's room uh, to write a better product description. Always keep your target market in mind when writing this description. These happens to be, the example happens to be women's rain boots. So think about what attracts women to boots, where they'll wear these boots, and about their buying habits and interests. Also use compelling keywords related to your products. Keywords are words that search engines and databases closely associate with a product or service. If I were to talk about boots, I might use keywords like waterproof, leather, rubber, comfortable, or durable. In this example, Chuka used sleek, plush, waterproof, rubber outer sole, self-cleaning, and rainproof. Okay, I think we got through online selling. Next, I want to talk about pop-up shops and flea markets since uh, um, they were talked about in Tamara E. Holmes's article. I group these together because they have many of the same requirements. They just cater to two different markets. Pop-ups cater to high-end markets and flea markets cater to a more general audience. Pop-up shops are a lot of work and take lots of planning because you have to follow state, municipal, and county licensing requirements. You have proper inspections, purchase insurance, which is optional but vital, and it takes lots of market research and planning. Pop-up shops are usually used by established brands and are a great way to take your product, uh, take your online product to a storefront or test a new product or product bundle. And of course, test a, a new location or demographic. So we're gonna take a deeper dive into licensing and permitting using the SBDC at UN and Valencia's quick start sheet. So let me open that for you. It's in our constant contact follow-up email. Perfect, let's make it bigger. And I, my, the way mine work, my mind works, I usually start at the bottom. So this is a kind of a quick uh, basic steps to starting a business right here. And remember the, mo the regulations in most municipalities or counties for temporary vendor permits, which is usually what you get for a pop-up shop, were created in the 1910s and 20s and governed businesses like revivals, traveling carnivals and circuses and door-to-door -door salespeople. So this goes to show how long it's been since most places thought about mobile commerce. This means government hasn't caught up with commerce. So you must create effective working relationships with your municipal in the municipality you want to uh, create a pop-up shop. So the first step, basic step in starting a business. And if you have a pop-up shop, you already have an online presence. Uh, you still need a temporary vendor permit at the location. So I suggest thinking about what you want your business structure to be. And if you are a sole proprietor, you could skip this step, but if you want to incorporate your business, maybe you take on liability in what you sell, uh, or maybe you're going on to a, um, into a business that's already established, you might take on some liability if something happens there. So you could always incorporate LLCs are very popular. You have to go through the secretary of state to get that paperwork. Next, you'll need a federal employer identification number. You may already have one if you're selling online uh, or if you have a storefront, and that's free to apply for through the IRS website. Then you're going to need a gross receipts tax ID number. You get this through the New Mexico Taxation and Revenue Department, and they use a website called TAP or Taxpayer Access Portal. And they also have great webinars that they offer twice a month because gross receipts tax um, calculation and payment is kind of a complicated task if you've never done it. You could also reach out to your SBDC advisor. Many of our SBDC advisors uh, are well-versed in gross receipts taxes. We can't give tax advice, but we could show you the, the proper way to create an account and use it. And then the final step and most, probably the most important in the, when talking about a pop-up shop, is to get your full business license or your temporary vendor permit 
and the municipality or county in which you're going to locate. If you had a food truck, you probably, maybe you have a restaurant in, in Albuquerque, but you wanted to go to Berlin for uh, the Becker Street Festival at the end of September, you'd have to get a temporary vendor's license in the city of Berlin. Uh, oftentimes the vendor permits cost more than a yearly permit. Uh, I don't know the logic behind that, but um, yearly permits are usually pretty cheap. As you see here, they're between, now they've gone up about $10, but they're between $25 and $45 a year. And if you have any questions about going into a temporary location, always contact the municipality because usually you have to go onto a commercial piece of property if I'm somebody who wants to have a tent sale and I wanted to locate on a high traffic area, but that piece of property is residential, I may have issues, but a municipal, the municipal offices are really eager to work with you. So now let's go back to our slideshow. And I wanna show you some cool examples of pop-up shops just so you can get the, the whole idea of what I'm talking about. So if you're from the Albuquerque metro area, like I am, uh, you near Halloween, you always see the Spirit Halloween store pop up in vacant storefronts throughout the town. Um, I remember our Walgreens went out of business and they popped up in the Walgreens location. They have an online presence all year round, but they have a physical presence uh, just before the holiday season. Let me show you West Elm. So West Elm is a furniture, an online furniture and decorating store. And they decided to pop up in a large retailer, something like Macy's to sell their products. So this is an example of an online retailer partnering with some a storefront that caters to the same target market, higher end, usually women uh, um, seeking these sort of things, furnishings, decorated things. One of my favorite concepts is, is a business called Mene. It was started by Paloma Picasso. And uh, what they do is they sell 24 karat gold jewelry. And in this example, they went into self, they decided to pop up, uh, create a pop-up shop in Selfridges in London. And I thought that was a great idea. Selfridges is a high-end department store. They sell high-end jewelry. Um, it was a great partnership, great way to test a, uh, the idea of a storefront and great way to test a, a demographic of people in the London area. Now let's go to the most appetizing of the three. And Cheetos uh, created a pop-up restaurant in the Tribeca area of New York. And they mainly did this for publicity, but you could see how somebody who maybe sold products solely online um, what our star client in 2017 was the Valencia flour mill. They make just add water mixes. And whenever they go to food or vendor shows, they make sopapillas from their mixes and, and muffins from their mixes. So if I did something like that, it would be a it would be kind of a fun idea to start a pop-up shop. So what Cheetos did is they hired a, a famous chef to create recipes with Cheetos and they uh, just open the restaurant for a limited amount of time in that area of New York, probably to garner interest in their product in that area of New York. Let me get rid of some of these windows and we'll go back to our slideshow. Everybody's gonna be Corella DeVille this Halloween looks like. Let's see. Perfect, okay. Just like with pop-up shops, food trucks and carts are permitting intensive and require great logistic skills. In order to operate a food truck, you need to be in compliance with the New Mexico uh, Environment Department's uh, codes as a mobile kitchen. And this requires using a, co a commercial kitchen as a commissary. So that even if you wanna be a food truck, you have to have a commercial kitchen as your commissary, especially if you're selling seafood or meats. And this hinders a lot of people when they're wanting to start up a, a food truck. This means contact, and, and then you have to find a commercial space to park your food truck. This means con, uh, contacting property owners and managers and creating a contract to lease the space and consistently parking in the area in which you wish to sell. 
You should also consider a location with lots of traffic and high, a high concentration of your target market. Uh, and when I say you have to find a piece of commercial property to rent, say you have a business in Albuquerque, you wanna sell your product in Los Lunas, um, you have to get that temporary vendor permit in Los Lunas or that full vendor permit. They're gonna ask you what your business address is, where, where you're actually gonna sell your product. And you have to show them a lease for them to grant you the business license. So it's a little bit, you know, paperwork intensive. Always contact your municipal, municipality or county and they could give you more advice on, on their temporary or full business licensing procedures. This type of distribution is a great way for testing a new product or for an established brand testing a location or a new demographic for their business. It's important to make a good working relationship with your chosen areas planning and zoning department because they can make or break your business idea. I mentioned target market earlier and you need to draw awareness to your new business and this means promotion. How are you gonna reach your target market, especially if you are in more than one location? Do you need a website? Do you need social media presence? Do you wanna mail a postcard to your current customers? It depends on the, uh, your market research and your target market's needs and wants. So now let's look at some examples of food trucks. I pass this one every Thursday through Sunday because they park near my home. So Sanchez Tacos, their food truck. Uh, what I like about this food truck is they consistently park in the same place all the time. And they have an online presence with the phone number you can call and their menu online. I think this is, a, uh, this is the same kind of idea as the Spirit Halloween store. And I think it's a great way to run a, a food truck business. The next ones are, are just are solely their food trucks that use social media solely for their their promotional methods. So this one happens to be um, with Love Waffles. They're a food truck, but they only have a Facebook presence where they uh, advertise their products. When using social media, even if you just use social media, it's important that you post often because I often look at these pages and they haven't posted in quite a while. And uh, this page is keeping up with their post-its pretty well. With love, waffles. And as you see with uh, the social media profiles, you could put your, a website. If you have one, this happens to be their square site, uh, an email address and a phone number. And with Google My Business, if you are uh, an entrepreneur that has a storefront, you could list all these things as well and they give you a free um, simple website. If you are um, somebody who is like a home-based business or has a service uh, service area, you could claim your Google My Business profile, but it would mainly be the maps. But that website will, they also give you that website and it, it's pretty cool for if you're just getting started. And let's see here, this is Crazy Dave's Burgers. The Blazing Barn and Food Truck, Food Truck and Catering. And I think what they do well on the social media pages, they post very appetizing photos of the food they make. Let's go back to our slideshow. Now I want to, I talked to you about research tools before, now I want to show you a few of them. Let me bring up my web browser and let me show you some uh, of a free research tool, two free research tools. And then I want to show you some that you'd have access to as an SBDC client, but you have to make an appointment with your SBDC center to access them. So the first three ones I want to talk about, New Mexico Council of Governments or New Mexico COGS, And these links are in the follow-up email, so don't worry. New Mexico Council of Governments keeps track of traffic counts throughout the state. Uh, 
And if you're in the central in central New Mexico area, um, they actually have the traffic counts map. Traffic will flows maps and busiest intersections. You could access the interactive map. So if I was a food truck or a pop-up shop, it would be very important for me to know which streets have uh, very high numbers of traffic and where my market is. So if I, maybe I was selling, uh, I was a mobile a truck that sold uh, fresh flowers. I might wanna go to a part of town that had higher incomes and had busy streets. Maybe I wanna do this on, if there's some commercial property available. This stretch of street happens to see in 2019, 44,208 on the uh, average daily traffic and the average weekday saw 47,489 past this stretch of street. So that would be a great place for a food truck or a mobile, uh, mobile type business. So that's a free one. The next one I want to talk about is um, Census Business Builder. And these links, again, they're in the follow-up email. Small Business Edition is what I like to use if you're in anywhere but a big city in New Mexico. If you're in a big city, the Regional Analyst Edition works pretty well. This has not been working for me in the past, the past few webinars. Let's see if it works today. So it's organized by NIAC or NAICS code. If you're a client of the SBDC and you meet with us, we have to put a NAICS code in for you. And if you need help finding yours, please reach out to your local advisor. If you're in one of the more common NAICS codes, say you're a retail shop, you're a clothing store, they have some uh, little quick press buttons there for you. And you could search by county, city, zip code, I could do Valencia County. And you could go to a map and you could explore the map. Valencia County only has one zip code or two zip codes. So I like to just create the report and read it. If I was in Albuquerque, it might benefit me to use zip code. If I was in Las Cruces, probably the same. And Business Builder just has not been working for me. I'm not sure what. So we're going to look at the Regional Analyst Edition. And we're gonna create the report in the regional analyst edition since that one wants to work. Small business edition hasn't been working for me. So let me show you what these what these reports until they have information about cust your customers, businesses like yours and consumer spending, which is probably my favorite. So say I'm an online store, I wanna know where I should best locate to sell uh, or maybe where I should advertise if I sold, I don't know, fidget toys if I knew what that my target market was. First, you always have to identify a target market. It gives you some demographic characteristics, some socioeconomic characteristics, so, and some housing characteristics. And when it, you're looking at this report, you wanna look at socioeconomic characteristics. So this happens to be 87002, which is Boleyn. The, here's the average income in Berlin. And when you're thinking storefronts or food trucks, um, I always like to go with the rule of thumb of you want to enter an area at or above the average household income, the national household income. Berlin's a little below, but it's getting up there. It's risen tremendously over the past five years. For my tradespeople on the call, housing characteristics is very important. I would probably want to go into a, pl a place that has a, a high housing value and old homes. 
So it gives you the, it used to, it used to give you the date they were built. It doesn't look like it gives you the date anymore. But I, I want to go into uh, an area with high home values. If I wanted to start an apartment complex, average rent versus average monthly owner cost, it looks like it's more expensive to rent than buy in the land right now. Information about uh, businesses like yours, there's not enough data um, available, so they don't have that information. But my favorite part is the average um, household consumer yearly expenditure. That's a lot of information. How much a household spends per year on a certain uh, category of, of products. So the one that always makes me laugh is the dating services. They Per, per household, they spend about 38 cents. If I was a food truck, I'd want to know how much people spend in this area dining out, um, dining out for breakfast, lunch, or dinner. Medical service, there's a lot of um, common industries here. So that census business builder. Let me take you into the databases that you have access to through your business advisor. The one I like to go over first is IBIS World. And what IBIS World is, is it's a database put, uh, of reports put together by economists that tell you the trends in industries. So say, women's clothing stores. I like to go over the high points of the report when I sit with a client. If you have, if you're um, a student of UNM, you also have access to these reports. So the first part of this report I find most helpful is the key external drivers. I like to call these the key economic drivers. So what drives the women's clothing business? Per capita, per capita disposable income, households earning more than $100,000 per year, external competitions for women clothing stores, and the number of adults age 20 to 64. And then you have your suppliers, and then you have your buyers, consumers, or uh, online auctions. This page tells you what the key external drivers are doing over the, it's usually over the next five years. They only went up to 2021 in this report, but they looked um, promising. This tells you what revenue is gonna do in that industry. It looks like it's gonna have a slight increase. The trend goes on for profit, profit margin, businesses opening and employment and wages. When you look at profit margin, you, when you see 2.2%, that's about 2.2 cents out of every dollar goes into the business's profit. When I see a very low profit margin, I think there's either a lot of competition or uh, it's an industry where you have to sell, 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 sell. So when I'm looking at the women's clothing store business, you want to sell product, you're, you're wanting to turn over that product quickly and profitably. This tells you the product or services that are most popular in this industry. Other apparel, outerwear, dresses, bottoms, tops. This gives you a SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Performance of the industry and the different drivers. We often hear about the V-shaped recovery. There it is. This tells you what uh, segment of the business life cycle this industry is in. This industry happens to be in the decline. That means more businesses like this are gonna close than open. And then major markets. Remember I told you this helps you identify your markets. So probably women, 
with household income, household incomes of 100,000 plus, or just people in the highest quintile of income, then the fourth income quintile, 30 point quintile. So that's the, those are the high points of IBIS world. Then we have access to a database called uh, Reference USA or Data Excel. They just changed their name. And this is like a phone book on steroids. So say I wanted to find out how many people in the 87002 zip code, one per household, had an estimated home income of 100,000 or more And I can't do these consumer snapshot, but I could do the lifestyle characteristics. And purchase things, purchase behavior, purchase things online, internet purchasing. Because I want to send them a postcard telling them I have a, an online store. There's a count of 757, so that's your potential market in Berlin. And you could actually get um, names and addresses so you can send them a postcard. Uh, you can't call them or email them unless you purchase the list, but you're free to send them a postcard or letter. Okay, now we want to go back. I also have access to Mintel marketing reports, which are reports put together by professional marketing, uh, marketing people. And they're also very um, informative. Okay, now I want to talk to you about using social media as a sales or marketing tool. Many people come to my office and tell me that social media marketing is going to change their business outcomes, but that's far from the truth. I want to show you when, the when and why of, about social media marketing. And I'm mainly going to concentrate on Facebook if I talk about anything, since that's the tool I'm most familiar with. Before, we begin and before you begin any social media marketing efforts, do market research and put intense thought into your target market or markets. If you don't know who you are serving and what they like, you'll not have success on social media. The target market on Facebook tends to be women 35 to 55 with higher incomes and typical consumer interests. If you have a retail store or restaurant, this is a great place to start. When you dive into social media, a social media marketing platform, think about using their paid advertising services and learn how to use them. And I, Facebook has a great learning um, website. It's called Facebook Blueprint. Let me show it to you. And this, this is a, the free classes that teach you how to use the advertising services of Facebook. So if you have any questions about that, go here. This is also good for Instagram. Um, Twitter has their own uh, learning tools. Uh, and so does LinkedIn. Let's go back to our slideshow. So here's some other helpful resources that are listed on this. There's some, there's, uh, here's a grouping of other resources for you. My favorite and most practical is Google My Business, and I wanna show you how to use it. So let me go to my internet browser, and you get there by typing google.com slash business. If you wanted to claim, if you have a physical presence, you could manage now, or you could create a sign in. If you have a Google account, you could sign in under your Google account. Let me see if I could sign in under the centers. Hold on one.
So when you create your account, I'm gonna show you ours at the Small Business Development Center. What it allows you to do is it allows you to um, update some information about your business. And let me show you this on the search. This is what it actually looks like. So the, on the right-hand side of the page is our Google My Business Profile. And we're able to uh, choose a category of service that we're in, put our location, put our service areas, put our hours. Um, if we have special hours or we're gonna be closed, we could put those. We could create, uh, we could put in our products or services. So if you sold products online, you could, and maybe you sold them directly from your own website, they may not be showing up in Google's shopping area. So you could list your products. You could create that small website. We don't, we have our own site, but, they, and they give you a URL or you could purchase a special one. And you have very few options, but it's a great way to get started. And if you're something like a food truck or a pop-up shop and you don't really need a, an online store, it's a, it's a great tool for you. You could put uh, add a user if you wanted to um, make somebody else a user on this profile. Maybe you don't want to maintain it. You want an employee to. You could create posts. Uh, just like on Facebook or social media, they're, they're posts that allow people to see uh, a picture and you can put a description under it. And then a uh, very cool part of this is you get insights. You could see how many people found you by directly searching for your business, how many people discovered you through a search, and then how many people found you from your branded uh, um, marketing materials. Branded for us would probably be, uh, they, they, we, we, uh, you might've heard about our webinars through uh, the radio or through a YouTube ad. They probably clicked on that ad. If you're doing a, a social media campaign, you'd wanna know if it was effective. So uh, maybe on August 24th, what did we do there? We might've put an ad out. Customer actions are people calling, clicking, or visiting your website. Popular times. So those are all very important things about, about Google My Business. Google also has another tool, and I might chat this over to everybody. So they have a keywords tool. So they scan your business profile and they tell you um, about keywords that people might be typing into Google to find your business. You have to have a profile to use it. So these are the su suggested keywords or themes, business marketing, business lead generation, business investment, outsourcing BPO, business HR management. These are some keywords uh, we may want to purchase on Google or use in our descriptions of our product or services. Oh, I stayed on that for quite a while. Let's go back here. And then I'll go down the list. So Social Media Examiner is a video blog that features social media marketing experts and they give great advice. New Mexico Internet Entrepreneurs is a great Facebook group created by Barb Tomlin as a forum for New Mexico Internet Entrepreneurs to connect, get helpful tips, and post new ideas. And remember, I told you I was going to show you a website to find attorneys. That's the New Mexico Bar Association. They have a, a database of attorneys sorted by practice area. I showed you New Mexico Council of Governments traffic counts. New Mexico Taxation and Revenue, if you're new to gross receipts tax, has great webinars and learning opportunities on their website. And the IRS has a great self-employed tax center because most people on the call today, if you're selling online, you're probably home-based, uh, considered self-employed. You need to know what to do with the money you make. 
since this is a COVID webinar, I included a slide of the most up-to-date um, and accurate websites related to COVID-19 regulations for small businesses. Uh, it's pretty self-explanatory, but the one I wanted to point out to you, probably uh, most important for our employers on the call, is the what you should know about COVID-19 and the ADA, the Rehabilitation Act, and other EEO laws. Now that we talked about how we can help you, this is how you could help the SBDC. As part of offering our services, uh, we need your help to ensure our services are around for many more years to come. So we ask that you participate in our surveys, report economic impacts because of our assistance to your advisor or director, and write a letter of support to your local legislator about your experience with the SBDC. All information is kept confidential and is only reported in aggregate to our funders the state of New Mexico and the Small Business Administration. Whew, we went over lots of information, so let's review what we learned. Market research and planning is important. You now have the resources you need to make better educated marketing decisions. So take an hour each month, each year, each quarter, to use the SBA's marketing plan templates to make and plan your marketing decisions. If there's anything I stressed in this webinar today, it's know your target market or markets. This is the least you must do before you spend any time or money on any promotional activities. Three, do you have the right skills to set up and manage an online store? Now that you know the major activities involved, does this seem like something you can do? Did you think online selling was so labor intensive? Now you know. So do you have the staff to answer customer questions, ship and handle returns? If you wanna start a pop-up shop or a food truck, are you able to meet state, municipal and county requirements and the tax requirements for your venture? And most importantly, are you prepared to handle the extra cleaning requirements, mandatory capacity limits and ever-changing regulations for our public safety? What if your pop-up shop had to close for two weeks because somebody tested positive for COVID-19? How would that affect your venture? This slide provides contact information for SBDC programs, PTAC or the uh, PTAC, IBA in New Mexico Tech, TCA. The Procurement Technical Assistance Center, or PTAC, is a government-funded program providing assistance to small businesses who want to sell their goods or services to the government, educational institutions, or tribal entities. The, Internet, Internet, the International Business Accelerator is a one-stop shop of resources for New Mexican businesses and individuals wishing to introduce their product or services into the global market. And the New Mexico Tech Technology Commercialization Accelerator offers no cost confidential counseling regarding intellectual property. This slide continues the list of small business resource partners, SCORE, or the Service Corps of Retired Executives, WEST, or the Women's Business Center Program, and VBOC, or the Veterans Business Outreach Center. Here is the contact information for your small business support team. We are funded by the SBA and many people ask about SBA guaranteed loans. So I included a, a link to their resource guide. They put, the SBA puts out one of these resource guides every year. And if you wanna know more about small, uh, small business administration loan guarantees, 27, it's, yep, on page 27, are all the SBA lenders. If you're a new business, uh, many conventional lenders won't fund you. You may have to seek the, the services of a community advantage lender or a participating micro lender. That's Wes, the loan funder DreamSpring. And then on page, what's this, 33, this talks about the different, different types of lending programs offered through the SBA. And I get a lot of questions about that. And then at the end of uh, the last uh, great resources, the New Mexico Economic Development Department. 
and they have a great website, goenm.biz, where they talk about their diff the different um, grant or funding opportunities they offer for businesses. So I'll go over those briefly with you. They're under business development, NMEDD programs for business. And then they have the JTIP program, which is the, uh, which you could read more about on the site. And then they have the finance development program. LIDA or the Local Economic Development Act provides uh, reimbursements for businesses, uh, usually in the manufacturing center, economic based job creators, uh, or value-added agriculture. Collateral assistance programs helps people get loans to start businesses that they may not uh, normally qualify for because they don't have the collateral to back that loan. And opportunity zones or zones created, um, you know, mo across New Mexico that are low income but have the opportunity for the development you could obtain financing through opportunity funds that you might not otherwise be able to obtain for a small business. And if somebody invests in an opportunity fund, and this is a business or an individual who has capital gains taxes, they want to defer the payment of those capital gains taxes by investing in an opportunity fund. And if they keep that investment for 10 years, they don't have to pay that capital gains until they sell their portion of that fund. So it's a cool little thing cool way to get private investment out to the public in economically disadvantaged areas. Okay, I finished with the slideshow. I want to thank you for spending time with me today. And I wanted to leave some time for Q&A. So let's open up the Q&A and see what questions you might have. Oh, that Giselle asks, she says, the slide on photos, what about Canva? Canva is also a stock photo uh, provider. And I love using Canva. In fact, if you, when you looked at our Google My Business page, you saw our cover photo. Uh, I created that in Canva. Margaret says, thank you. Thank you, Margaret. I'm going to open up our list of participants. I see we have a phone caller. I'm going to allow you to talk. You are on mute, but if you have a question, you could go ahead and ask it at any time. I know you can't type one in the Q&A. If anybody wants to speak their question instead of typing it into the Q&A, please raise your hand for me. Hi, phone caller. Hi, it's Sherry. I just couldn't get online as usual, but I listened to everything and wrote, I uh, took notes. I just want to let you know. <laughs> Very good. Thank you for spending time with us today, Sherry. Okay. And then Giselle says, anything different to consider for services offered virtually? Uh, Giselle, you might want to... Uh, follow up on that question are you talking about maybe uh, you know the fiverr upwork task rabbit those are great services for people wanting to um, offer their services virtually are you talking about using zoom maybe or or cisco's webex or a, a platform called blue jeans um, those are great uh, platforms to consider Giselle says, life coaching or music events? Hmm. For life coaching, I would assume you need a program kind of like Zoom to uh, video conference face-to-face -face with people. Blue Jeans is one that I've used that I really liked. I like Zoom because that's what we primarily use here. And WebEx is good too. Uh, if you're doing life coaching, it's you really have to create a brand for yourself. I would uh, suggest creating a website with a blog or a video blog and creating uh, articles or videos that talk about your expertise. For music events, uh, social media might be a great venue for you there. Perfect, thank you. 
I'm going to open my participants. I'll wait here a few more minutes if you have any questions. I'm happy to answer them. I usually go a little long in this webinar, and I'm glad we finished a little bit early today, actually. I'm surprised. Can I remind everyone that our uh, New Mexico Small Business Development Center uh, YouTube channel is available for any of our pre recorded on demand uh, webinars? So it has sure. all kinds of information about um, e commerce to revisit uh, the webinar today. We also have um, all kinds of um, webinars on finance, marketing. Pretty much anything that you might be interested in for your small business. And it's, uh, um, Chris, do you include it in the follow-up email, the link? I think it's in those little, those icons at the bottom. But okay, let me perfect. just chat it over to everybody now. Okay. It'll be a special little treat for them. Make sure it goes on to everyone. So there we chatted over the link for the YouTube channel. Thank you for that reminder. Okay, I see our participants are starting to log off. You're welcome to log off now. If you have a question, I'll stay for about two more minutes. Thank you, Sarah. Okay, Leslie, everybody's gone. Do you have anything for me? I do not. Thanks as always, Chris.